we're going to start the studio now. A couple of uh, guys who have been I, uh, I have an announcement that I, I want to make before we get started. Uh, I wasn't actually one of you. I am the conservative commentator. I will be defending Donald John America. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, I am here in urban Dallas talking to 26 Kamala Harris supporters, me versus the masses, for your education and viewing enjoyment. We will be discussing topics like immigration, the economy, character, abortion, foreign policy, and democracy and corruption. And I, for my own safety, had to go undercover. But that's not what matters. What matters is that Donald John America wins the presidency. And that's what we're going to make sure happens in this conversation by having a productive dialogue with some of the smartest people I have ever met. Democrat, precinct chairs, college students, everyday people, all with political ambitions and all whose votes count equally to your own. I've seen a lot of stuff like this, but why should they get to have all the fun? We will be doing six segments of 15 minutes each on the aforementioned topics, and participants will be able to come up to the table and speak as long as they like, or until they are vetoed by a crowd of their peers who are perhaps dissatisfied with their performance, as indicated by the waving of the American flags, at which point they will be considered on borrowed time, as indicated by the graphic on your screen, and our tremendous moderator will find a good place to pause the conversation and send somebody else up to take their place. We're very excited about this. This was a big undertaking. We threw it together in like 36 hours. So leave a comment. Let us know your thoughts. Let us know if you liked it. Let us know if you want to see more stuff like this. Be sure to leave a like while you're at it. Subscribe to the channel. Go out and vote. And of course, go to the website and give us money or else the liberals will win. But most importantly, please enjoy your experience as I most certainly did. From what I understand, the United States of America is considered, I believe, the most compassionate country in the world because no other country, from what I understand, illegal immigrants. Mm -hmm. And Kamala Harris wants to keep families together. That is important. Yeah. Because, because without the basic family unit, societies will collapse. Mm -hmm. Why is Donald Trump trying to deport 20 million Illegal. I mean, I know they broke the law or whatever. They overstay their visas or they're crossing the borders. Yeah, and they're not getting caught. But uh, w why is the government this out of control? And why is Donald Trump now just uh, addressing the issue when it sure. should have been addressed during his term? I mean, it's getting out of control. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, we don't have the infrastructure. Texas is almost froze to death. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the family is important. Sure. So I believe, you know, Kamala Harris has a plan because not everybody here has the right to be here. So what can Donald, why is Donald Trump's plan better? So when you say Kamala has a plan, that means a plan for dealing with illegal immigration, which you agree is a problem. Um, he wasn't a problem until, unfortunately, seems like uh, since Donald Trump took office, he's the one that ad addressed the issue because... I mean, I was born and raised here, but uh, when I was a, like a toddler, my mm -hmm. mom put us in India. Yeah. And the thing was, the gov Indian government, she put us there for three, four years because she failed. Her story is the nursing board exam. She was only making $3. She didn't really know anybody. She didn't have babysitters. So uh, the Indian government kicked us out of the country. They deported us. I guess it would be that Donald Trump wants to be a president for Americans and to look out for American interests. And okay. like you said, I mean, with 20 million, however many millions of people who are here illegally, um, unfortunately, they're just not our concern. I mean, we can't be the sort of caretaker for the entire world. And there are American citizens even here in Texas who, like you said, with the infrastructure, they can't heat their houses in the winter. They can't keep them cool in the summer. And a lot of people who are here illegally are unfortunately putting strain on that infrastructure system because we don't know who to account for, who to build an infrastructure system for, because we don't even know how how many people are in the state. And so I don't think that you can begin to really solve those problems until you deal with the fact that there are millions of people here, as you said, who just simply have no right to be here. How are you doing, sir? Hey. John. Daniel. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. So um, quick question for you. Yes, sir. Do you feel like it is wrong 
So I was born here, but half of my family wasn't, right? Yeah. So normally how it works is when you get a business mm -hmm. or when you uh, buy a house, you kind of like slowly bring a person in one by one. Yeah. Like once this person gets settled, you bring another person. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like in that way, because I know Ill illegal immigration is one thing, mm -hmm. but do you feel like it's also illegal for us to help family members who don't have all their credentials and we're doing stuff for them like in a like CPN type of way? Mm -hmm. I mean, principally, I don't think it's the worst idea in the world, but what tends to happen is when you have something like that, like with anything, it tends to be exploited. And so you might have somebody come over and they're doing very well in the country. They start a business. They want to bring their family over. I have no issue with that. But again, like with anything, you have instances where it's exploited to then bring over entire families, extended families through, I mean, it's referred to you know, in politics yeah. as like chain migration. And I have to have a problem with that because it's not only the illegal immigration, but it's like you've had, I think, a million people on average every year who have come in legally. And and you look at what those people are doing in this country and they're taking jobs that otherwise would have gone to Americans. Um, even in the, the post-COVID economy, all net job growth on average has gone to immigrants as opposed to um, you know, native-born Americans. And so as somebody who simply wants to put the interests of America first, that's why I support Donald Trump because you know, he wouldn't allow for the country to basically exist as an economic zone where anybody in the world can come into it and do whatever they want, uh, but more as a home for Americans, you know, the people who have been here for generations. And I think that we're entitled to that. I think every other yeah. country in the world gets to say that, I think that America should be able to say that too. Do you feel like it also has something to do with the amount that the visa, not the visa, but like the passport, you know, weighs versus one economy, you know, like American visa Could be. versus an African visa. Sure. You like that's why. Sure. I think that's, um, there's an idea that that people use to get elected into office that is to basically say, um, you know, America, it can be for everybody. And that's the whole point of the country. Yeah. I, I don't think that's true. I believe in American exceptionalism. I think that American people are the highest quality in the world. And I don't. Think Hi. America was built on immigration. And if I'm correct, mm -hmm. Trump wife is an immigrant. That's true. OK, then. So therefore, um, we, America was built on America, uh, immigrants. My parents are immigrants, mm -hmm. Jamaican and Panamanian, mm -hmm. okay? And um, I feel as though how he's trying to treat the immigrants is wrong. The immigration system has been like that for years. It's mm -hmm. been wrong for years and no one corrected it. Kamala had a, a solution for it. Trump uh, didn't, he called his people and had it canceled. Mm -hmm. So now he's using that as a ploy to, uh, to have something to go ask Kamala about, oh, immigration. The immigration when bill, he right? he's the one who did it. Mm -hmm. He canceled it. Mm -hmm. Nobody else tried to fix the immigration system. They did. Mm -hmm. Yes, they let people in to help come in. They're compassionate. They mm -hmm. want people to have enough. America was built on immigrants, doing the jobs that Americans don't want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that I think there's a difference between immigration during the Ellis Island period, where you had people coming from Northwestern Europe, and they were coming and seeking better lives, building businesses, things like that, as opposed to what we see now, which is largely immigration from the third world, um, India, Latin America, places like that, where people are coming and they're simply just different. They're culturally incompatible with what we've built in America. And you see that because when they build businesses or they build communities, they exist as, you know, communities of that ethnicity. They wave the flag of the countries from which they came, as opposed to, you know, Italians or Irish who came to the country and they were ready to wave the American flag. And so I think it's just a different kind of immigration that uh, we're talking about. So I wouldn't say that America is built by immigrants. I think America was built by settlers, by people who came and conquered and tamed this continent and who have built what is, I believe, the greatest civilization in history. And I don't think that we need to rely on other people to do that for us. I Italians think that we've been doing it just in, fine. Irish people came mm -hmm. into America. Sure. They came in. They were the first immigrants to come in, flooding mm -hmm. the American with that. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Okay. Then. So now it seems like it's a problem because they're Mexicans and they're from Southern countries. Well, it's not just, you know. And, and on top of it, to be inhumane as to take their kids away from them. You don't, we, America is not supposed to do that. That's back in slave mentality. And he just was on TV stating that, oh, Lincoln was uh, a so-called uh, okay president because he didn't try to negotiate the Civil War. Are you kidding? That's the reason why we had the Civil War, because they didn't want to abolish slavery because they were taking the kids away from their family and giving us 
no names, no ha no backgrounds, no nothing to us. And he's trying to do the same thing. Um, I would only say I think that it is actually in the best interest of the child for those procedures to happen simply because we don't have any record that these people are actually their parents. There could be human trafficking. Wow. It could be a number of things. And by the way, those policies were happening, too, during the Obama administration. But the media wasn't concerned about it then. I think they'd like to be concerned about it under a Trump administration because they want to paint Trump as like this evil bad guy, which I just I don't think is true. Um, and on the immigration bill you mentioned, that is true. You know, Trump killed the immigration bill. But I think that's ultimately good because what that would have done is put into law things that are happening now, which should not be happening. On day one of Biden's administration, he issued executive orders to stop construction of the border wall to end remain in Mexico, all these things to allow for people to flood into the country from God only knows where. And so that Kamala has a plan, I think in practice only means she has a plan to put more resources into allowing for these people to come into the country, processing the applications right. faster, but not actually stop the flow, which is what Americans have wanted for decades. Yes, sir. Uh, the immigration, since I can remember, I think the last time I voted was in 88 because of the immigration. Mm -hmm. That's like 30 plus years ago. Yes, sir. And I think immigration always comes up during election time mm -hmm. and nothing seems to get done. Mm -hmm. So this is just another process of gathering votes, collecting votes, you being who you say you are. How can you stop immigration? I think that uh, the reason immigration has continued in the way that it has um, against the will of the public, by the way, if you look at the public polling on the issue, Americans have said consistently for decades, we would like less immigration, not no immigration, just less. But for some reason, it's never happened. But every 10 or 15 years or so, what we do get is we get like an amnesty. Like we got one under Ronald Reagan, for example, where he amnestied people who were here illegally, gave them a pathway to citizenship. You see that being discussed again now to deal with uh, what they say is 11 million people who are here illegally. But I think ultimately the reason that there's no progress made on the issue is because there's too much benefit to the political class. People on the right, people who are Republicans who are installed into office by big corporations, those big corporations like immigration because it puts pressure on the cost of labor. And so they have an incentive to lobby for more immigration because then they can pay less for labor and they can make more money. People on the left, I think, have an incentive to do the same, not because of labor cost, but because what tends to happen is immigrants vote something like between seven and eight out of 10 for Democrats. And so as you see more immigrants coming to the country, you see more votes for Democrats. And so both parties have a political incentive to allow for immigration to continue, which is why of all issues, tax policy, healthcare, you know, they go back and forth. Immigration, there's never been a debate until Donald Trump. They'll say, oh, we're going to solve it. They'll tell you whatever they need to, like you said, every four years. But really nothing has been done until Trump said, we have to build a wall. We have to do something. But until then, it wasn't even really a conversation because I think it's too much benefit for people in charge to allow for just total immigration in the country, be that through legal means, illegal means, or what have you. So again, it's nothing's going to be done. I think Trump can do something. I think when Trump talks about um, having the what he says is the largest mass deportation operation in the history of the country, I think when he talks about building a wall, talking about increasing requirements for people to come over legally, I mean, he did manage to do a lot through executive action so that even in his first administration, he cut in half legal immigration, 50% decrease, and then the illegal crossings also went way down compared to what they are now or compared to what they were under Obama. So it's not a perfect fix, but in four years, I'm, I'm proud of the job that he did. Hmm, I need to rethink my thing. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, sir. Um, one more thing. Yes, ma'am. Trump said that he was going to get the Mexicans to pay for the war, mm -hmm. and it didn't happen. It didn't happen. Yeah. Trump said he was going to do a lot of things and it didn't happen. Sure. Because he didn't care. I don't he know. He wanted it's... it to get out of hand so that he could have more reasons to try to go after the next Biden. Well, it was Biden back then. Mm -hmm. So he didn't he doesn't plan on doing anything. He just talks. As someone who has to I have to frequently defend this to other Republicans because they'll tell me the same thing. He as, talks. So. Talks nonsense. Yes. The problem is, like I mentioned to the other gentleman, it's you have a situation where everybody wants immigration to continue. And so if Donald Trump is the only voice in politics saying, I would like immigration to stop, he is going to face opposition from the establishment in doing that, which is why we all know in the last two and a half years, we've sent $200 billion to Ukraine, which I don't even know where that is on a map, but we've given them $200 billion. The wall was supposed to cost $8 billion. That's pennies on the dollar, but we couldn't get it done. And it isn't because Trump didn't want it to get done. It's because at every level, even his own Congress, people like Paul Ryan, Ryan. Because he talks, that's why. People like Paul Ryan, these neocons, establishment, they talks. didn't want that to that's happen. All he, does. he faced opposition. He doesn't, that no he's one no else action. Does. He's all talk. He's no action. 
Hi. Oh. I just have um, three yes or no questions. Uh, Do I get to elaborate or is it literally just... I mean, we only have a minute left, so I just okay, want to okay, get okay. through all three. My first question is, um, is Donald Trump's... Did Donald Trump's wife, Melania, come here as an immigrant through legal means? And also, did Donald Trump establish her citizenship? He did. Through legal means? Correct. That's interesting because up until they actually just discussed in the last 12 months that she wasn't here legally as a citizen. Oh, she wasn't? She wasn't here legally. And that, that was the, the reason time. that she wasn't actively involved as a first lady. Mm. Um, so my second question is, are you indigenous to the Americas? And also, is Donald Trump indigenous to the Americas? When you say indigenous, do you mean um, like I was born here? Are or? you from an ancestral line that is considered indigenous to the Americas? Or is Donald Trump? Um, I don't know that Trump is. I am approximately 1% Chippewa. So technically, yes. Exactly. Right. Thank you. That's all. I don't think there was a third question. Angel, nice to meet you. John, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, so I have one question, and this is from after watching the debate. Um, something that did stick out to me, and I've thought a lot about, is... Trump's plan to impose tariffs. Mm -hmm. um, he says it's going to increase domestic production, which I understand it's going to force companies to actually produce in America. However, sure. that is going to increase the cost of goods for Americans. Groceries that we're trying to make affordable again are mm -hmm. going to become more expensive. Mm -hmm. The average grocery bill is 112. Um, I mean, it's insane. I just want to ask, like, yeah. as a Trump supporter, how do you see that as an economy that is better than what we have right now? That's a great question. Um, and because like Trump's in office, we have the tariffs. It doesn't exist in a vacuum with just the tariffs. And so if you've got now more domestic manufacturing in a Trump economy, you also have things like lower energy costs, um, things that are, you know, lowering the cost of inputs into these businesses so that but they're able to produce. businesses are going to increase the price of their products. Well, if they're competing with... Because they're going to have to accommodate for whatever they're paying to yes. produce in America, correct? But if they are not having to put as much money into those because the cost of energy is cheaper, it's cheaper to move stuff around, you know, domestically, that may even offset the uh, price that would be be imposed on the consumer by, you know, the tariffs on foreign goods. Moreover, I think that if you look at the history of, you know, any economy, really, it's like production equals prosperity. And I think the American economy is doing very poorly because we don't make anything over We're here. We're under Trump's tax plan, though. I'm not talking about taxes. I'm talking about production. Well, I'm just saying in things. general, we're still, you're mm -hmm. saying the economy is doing better, but we're under Ta Trump's tax plan. If there is a misconception that we're under Biden's right now. The economy is not doing very well. It I is don't not. No. Right. It's not. And it, I'm just pointing out a misconception that it's something I learned as well, that mm -hmm. we're under Trump's tax plan. And whoever becomes a new president has the authority yeah. to rewrite that. There's more, though, to the economy than, than just tax policy, it's right? It's a big part, though. Of course. But, you know, production is also very important. And right now, the American economy is based on basically like moving numbers around on screens, but we don't actually really produce anything, which is why all the job growth that we've seen in the last 10 or 15 years has been things in like the service industry. We haven't seen long term sustainable jobs and things like manufacturing because all of that has been offshored. And Donald Trump wants to return that back. And I think that's something that should be uh, should definitely be done because, you know, you look at the history of this country when we had the most of our economic growth in like the latter half of the 19th century into the beginning of the 20th century, something like 95% uh, of all those goods that we were importing had tariffs on them. You look at every man who's on Mount Rushmore, all of those guys were protectionists. They all supported tariffs. Um, I mean, this is what has built the economy of South Korea, Japan, every economy that's ever really been powerful has done so because they are producing things domestically. And America has decided to stop doing that to try to basically extend its power throughout the world, you know, getting into bed with China, with whomever. Mm -hmm. And all that's done is empower these other countries, which are incompatible with what we believe are American values. And so I don't think long term there's any real solution but to make American uh, manufacturing great again. OK. And so going back to manufacturing mm -hmm. again, um, part of his tax plan would be to also cut tax for people who are making a lot more for bigger companies, for sure. billionaires, for millionaires. But mm -hmm. the thing is that puts it back on the middle class, which the middle class is a known fact, is the hardest working group of in America. Sure. Correct. Um, so again, I ask, when you say that you believe Trump will build a better economy, he's building a better economy for people who already are doing well, if not for the rest of their life, generationally, right? They're set for life. Yeah. And then you have lower excuse me, lower class, middle class who are busting. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse, but they're busting their butts. Yeah. Um, 
and it almost seems as if it's for nothing. You have immigrants who come here and they work so incredibly hard mm -hmm. and it's almost as if it's for nothing because they can never see progress because either taxes are going up and inflation is going up. That How seems is, to be happening more now, though, under than, than under the Trump administration. But under, the under Trump ad Trump's administration, we were under Obama's tax plan. That's a, yeah, no, his like big legislative accomplishment was the tax Obama cuts and jobs act. Obama handed a wonderful economy off to Trump, which he then destroyed. That's not unfortunately true. No, though, it is true. If you because... look at our numbers, if you look at the numbers, Obama handed Trump an mm -hmm. economy where jobs, people had jobs, jobs, the job. Um, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, joblessness, people yes. who don't have jobs, that yes. rate was a lot lower. Yes. That, thank you. Unemployment. Thank you. Unemployment, the unemployment rate was a lot lower. Um, mm -hmm. And that was because Obama handed over to Trump. What he inherited from the Bush economy, right? With Again, crash. but we're still saying when the presidency was passed over to Trump, mm -hmm. it was not where it was. Once Trump entered office, it sharply declined. Yes. And Republicans, specifically Trump supporters, want to blame Biden for this. But what you're referring to, though, with the Obama job growth, again, those are service industry jobs. You look at the actual numbers of what those jobs were that were being created. Those were not sustainable, high income, high earning jobs like a manufacturing job, for example. If you look at consumer confidence, small business confidence towards the last two quarters of Obama's administration, all of that was going down and it went back up under Trump because he cut regulations, he cut taxes, which, you know, he cut his taxes for who? He, he cut taxes for the middle class because the average middle class family saw, I think, $6,000 more in their pocket because of Trump's tax plan. The lower class even had 40% uh, 40 higher real uh, household net worth. And all of that now under the Biden economy has gone down. So um, I understand what you're saying about, you know, cutting taxes for wealthy people. Maybe they create more businesses and things like that. But everybody saw that. Everybody saw those returns. And I think that's why you look at who's endorsing Kamala now. It's all the Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan CEOs, and everyone is against Trump. So all the people who you think would be pulling the strings, these billionaires, they're all on for Kamala Harris. And Elon Musk is not for Kamala Harris. That's, but that's one person. That's though. one person. That's right? Elon he was a, a really, really large influence on many sure. parts of the industry. But you're talking about like the people in working on Wall Street, the bankers, the finance. You look at even that And you're saying they're turning to support Kamala, correct? Absolutely. Why do you think Abs that is? Because Kamala Harris is an establishment candidate who will keep things going as they are. And Donald Trump wants to reverse that to actually put the interests of Americans first. There are several... Again, these are these are individuals. If you look at who actually in different services are reporting support for Trump versus Kamala, the only two occupations in this country which have majority support for Trump, I believe, are law enforcement and maybe postal workers or something like that. Nice to meet you, Mr. Doyle. John, nice to meet you. You and I, you look, we look alike. Really? You think so? A little bit. Yeah, we have. This is, I mean, not, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you're, you're a handsome guy, you know, oh, thank you. you're one of us. Um, so I just wanted to get back to the imports. You said that sure. you believe like a 20% cross the board import. Um, I don't know if I would I would give a figure exactly. I'm not an economist, but I think that policy is directionally correct, yes. You think it's directionally correct? I mean, to be fair, Trump also said like he doesn't really care about the rate. Like it could be 100%, 200%, whatever it has to be. Um, so the, the rate doesn't matter. But I mean, if you have that across the board, I don't see how you could think that the cost that the consumers in America would experience would not rise. I mean, the mm. cost of labor would be significantly higher if it was in the United States or if it's still imported. Obviously, there's a 20 percent or 10 percent increase that they have to make up for to maintain their margins. Sure. Um, well, I think, I mean, the tariffs themselves seem to be a pretty good idea because the, the Biden administration has even kept the tariffs that Trump imposed on China. Um, and in terms of how it would affect costs, again, we're trying to think for the long term. I mean, you look at like how China has managed to arise as a global power in just the last few decades because of their manufacturing. We have spent so much time and so much money focusing on the Middle East in this century. And that has been a complete waste of time, obviously. And it's enabled the rise of these other powers. And so while I could maybe sympathize with the idea that it would increase costs if, you know, it were a vacuum where we've got these tariffs now, I think 20 years from now it would make for a much more accessible economy for everybody. And even then, you know, what is happening right now with inflation because of things like the Inflation Reduction Act, because of these policies just pumping money in, trying to simulate, you know, aggregate demand or something from these Keynesians, that hasn't actually worked. And we're still seeing inflation that is making people make less money. So even if they are able to, you know, uh, get more money because of the labor or whatever, it's worth less than it would be under a Trump economy where inflation's under control, which it was. We were hitting like 1%, 2% inflation under Trump. Now they've never hit any of their landmarks for what they wanted to be under the Biden administration. Yeah. So I just want to get back to that. Just you said, and you know, initially in your response that when it came to the tariffs that Biden had kept them. But I think it's important to recognize that what Trump is referencing is something that's different than what he had uh, put into place during his administration. 
um, specifically where it was uh, with China or with specific goods mm -hmm. or uh, industries, uh, whereas the one that he is trying to roll out or would attempt to roll out during his uh, next administration, if he's elected, would be one that would apply to all countries, including our island allies, like for example, in the EU. Um, and it would also uh, go across all industries and services or products. And so um, tariffs, if you talk to economists, can potentially be beneficial from uh, helping your domestic industry if it's done so in a targeted and methodical way. But mm -hmm. if you're just doing it from like a universal tariff, um, as Trump tends to do for the purposes of uh, generating tax revenue, mm -hmm. um, it's going to lead to uh, increased prices. It could lead to a recession um, because ultimately tariffs are not intended primarily as a source of revenue. Um, they are mainly meant to, as you tried to mention earlier, with the uh, trying to help and assist with the development or the but maintenance you know that of that's the, how the domestic industry. Gets something like eighty percent of its revenue was just through tariffs before it was more reliant upon the income tax. Yeah, but I'm saying in this economy as it is now, I mean, with how global, it, I mean, obviously everyone can agree that we live in a global economy mm -hmm. and that the U.S. plays a dominant role with uh, the global currency mm -hmm. with the dollar. Um, it's not really realistic to think that. Uh, that 20% that we're going to put onto uh, all imports um, is going to lead to a, a significant increase in our revenue that uh, won't be experienced by the consumer, and that would make the cost of uh, childcare, like Donald Trump say, sure. a negligible cost. Um, it's mainly intended to um, help industry, mm -hmm. but only so in a direct and targeted way, which he has uh, no intention of doing. I don't think that's true. I think that, uh, you know, in 2015, when he made his announcement, he asked the question, when's the last time you saw a Chevrolet in Tokyo? And I think that sort of speaks to how he views American production and the American presence in the world, where it's like, you know, if he says flippantly, like across the board, X number, you know, Trump says a lot of things that are just Trump being Trump. But in terms of what we actually see, the fruits of his administration pursuing, we saw more manufacturing. We saw job growth in those industries, which is more sustainable than we see now. And I think, again, we're looking at where our children are headed, where our future's headed. Whatever's going on right now, I don't think that we can imagine will continue 20, 30 years in the future. Yeah, yeah you mentioned uh, Chevrolet. So, I mean, obviously, we can talk about auto manufacturing with the UAW endorsing Biden and manufacturing growth uh, within the United States. We've seen um, hundreds of thousands of jobs in the manufacturing sector um, that have um, obviously been as a part of uh, Biden's administration due to having um, stronger policies on the economy than Trump. And if you look at the 21st century, uh, Democratic politi politicians, presidents uh, typically do better on job growth mm -hmm. and um, stock market and unemployment. So they typically do better um, from most um, basic sort of uh, federal economic measures. Yes, you know, and I know I'm sure you are aware of the union sort of politics there. So I think that if you pulled specifically union members, like right now, if you go and drive through Detroit, where I'm originally from, you can see where the UAW guys hang out and they have big Let's Go Brandon signs hanging outside. So um, while, you know, the union politics is what it is with any sort of union, I think that ultimately the people who are working the jobs understand that Trump is better for them uh, than, you know, the alternative option, which even then, I mean, how, how would you then explain the consumer confidence about the economy right now, um, the way people are struggling to make payments on groceries, rent, car insurance, anything versus what we saw under Donald Trump. I mean, people seem to be experiencing the economy in a way that's less favorable to them now than they were under Donald Trump. Is that simply because it was all Trump's fault and we're just feeling that now? I mean, why have they not fixed that in three years? What, what's the answer there? Yeah, so first I just want to respond and say that a majority of UAW workers and union members do support Biden and Sean Fain, the president, does support Biden and does support Harris. Um, and that's why when Trump tried to do a union members event, uh, he didn't even go to a, uh, uh, a union approved uh, event. It was uh, not held by or attended by union members, um, regardless of what he tries to say about it. And then when you're talking about, oh, why are people concerned about the inflation uh, under Biden's administration? Uh, that's obviously an issue and it doesn't speak to um, what I was talking about with the 21st century in terms of like an aggregate. Um, but the inflation is obviously a problem, and it's not solely Trump's fault or Biden's fault. I mean, there's a lot more to inflation than who's president. Uh, obviously, in this case, you could look at the pandemic and the influence that that had on the economy, not only in the United States, but on a global perspective. Sure. And inflation was experienced uh, globally, and it's not something that any president could fully fix because of ex experience around the world because of a global pandemic. Even if the president doesn't specifically wield the power of monetary policy, there's a sort of coalition with the people in the president's party who are more or less influenced by it. And uh, yeah, I mean, the absolute 
rate of inflation is still high, of course, because of the things you mentioned. But even the policies they were pursuing to bring down the relative rate of inflation have not met the benchmarks, which they were predicted to have met. So we're still feeling that um, and it's still getting worse, even if, you know, it's not as bad as it was during uh, the pandemic. And Trump, by the way, recovered all those economic losses in the, in the final two quarters of his administration. You know, the economy tanked because of COVID. And by the time he left the White House, it was back on the road to recovery because of what he was doing. And Biden took that and they do the CHIPS Act, the um, Inflation Reduction Act and all of that. They pour a trillion dollars into the economy and people are now feeling that two, two and a half, three years later. Yeah. So two things real quick. Uh, with the inflation, it is lowering as you as you mentioned. And I um, would say that if you care about inflation, the cost of goods, as has been mentioned, a 20% universal import would definitely lead to an increase in the cost of goods that uh, American consumers are going to experience. Uh, but alongside that too, uh, you mentioned that uh, with like the CHIPS Act um, as like a a policy that Biden pursued. Mm -hmm. I mean, are you in support of the CHIPS Act? I mean, if, if you care about like American uh, industry and, you know, trying to right. foster a strong domestic industry um, through, uh, you know, policy, I would imagine that you would support the CHIPS Act or at least the initiative behind it. Sure. Well, I think that tariffs being something to boost uh, man American domestic manufacturing would be something that would help deal with inflation because you're producing more goods here. I think that uh, a Trump administration, which would bring those things in, would generally deal with inflation better. And then in terms of the CHIPS Act itself, if you ask me, on paper, do I support making chips here so we're less dependent on Taiwan? Of course. But again, it's the administration which is executing these things, which is why we're two years into the CHIPS Act and only something like 1% of the funding has been allocated. There's no direct database of where it's been allocated. And all the factories have announced that they're delaying production. Um, so, nice to meet you. How are you doing, sir? Good. John, nice to meet you. Kobe. Um, oh, do I start to? Uh, yeah, oh. I mean, Trump's character. I, okay. I think that it's generally good. I mean, I don't look to Donald Trump like you. You will never hear me say the sentence, you know, I just think Donald Trump is the best example of how to be a good husband and someone who's very humble about their means. But I think that uh, what Donald Trump represents as a leader is something that's ultimately good. I think that he does put him uh, put American interests before himself. And yes. um, I think that uh, especially when compared to his opponent, Kamala Harris, I don't think that she has integrity. I think that she's doing this to benefit herself. I think that most people in Washington, most people in politics do the same. I think that Trump is a rare example of somebody who's willing to literally lose money, have lower net worth, experience bullying it's all sorts of things, legal problems, if it means that he can make his country better. And I think that that's uh, something that's ultimately good. I, I do agree with that. But I do have a, mm, I guess let me put it like this. Sure. Um, my mom used to wake me up instead of differently than other children. She used to be like, um, school is, it's time for school. You know, you know, I guess go ahead and get up. But she would whisper it to me instead of someone saying, get up, Herb, you know, yeah. come on. So I feel like Kamala. Um, I'm sorry. That sounds like a touching well, story. I'm just saying Kamala Harris is more of a um, a motherly figure. More nurturing. Trump is more yeah. kicking the. Yeah, I get that. I understand. But he'll get the job done. What was wrong with that story? You there was nothing wrong with that story. However, I'm, there was nothing wrong with that story. No, but I think it misses the point of this topic, which mm -hmm. is the character. Sure. Somebody who has the audacity to say that he feels free to grab women by their genital area. Mm. He has a wife. He has made sexual, he's made sexual comments about his own daughter, his own daughter. What were those comments? What were his comments? Yeah. That if she wasn't his daughter, if she was his daughter, he would go ahead and marry her or date her. That is not something you say about your daughter. He said this. He's talked about his daughter with Howard Stern. Um, is that American exceptionalism? I think that we are talking about Donald Trump as a presidential candidate. As a presidential candidate. He's a convicted felon. An offhand comments he makes on felon. radio He's shows. He's a liar. I don't think he the charges are propaganda legitimate. propaganda about Haitians. How what, what, is that what was the propaganda about the that Haitians? That they're eating cats and dogs in Springfield. Are those they're the memes? They're not. No, no, no. That is something he said in the presidential debate. Hmm. He said with his whole chest that they're eating cats and dogs in Springfield, Ohio. There were videos of people eating cats and there dogs. There has been in no Ohio. known report. There yes, has there been have. the authorities have said there's been they're spreading propaganda. Haitians there were are videos now of it. no Haitians are now experiencing hate crimes because of something he said. That was an unsupported claim he made, okay. a very dangerous claim he made. How is that somebody you want to say has a good character? 
I'm not concerned about comments he's made on radio shows in terms of it's, the... It was a presidential debate. It well, wasn't with the stuff show. he said about his daughter. Um, and then in terms of the presidential debate, things he's saying about what's going on in Springfield, there were videos I saw of people walking with geese, with cats, and they were cooking them outside. Those are they real were videos. Haitians? They were Haitians? I, has it been reported I by not, Springfield? It has not. Yes, there were residents all they over reporting said it. They have said it has were, not... Okay, a resident? Yes. Again, they can just say whatever. Just like Trump said in the presidential debate, they can also say that. But I, there's no... Facts. There have been no known reports made to Springfield that that is actually. I don't think happened. that's true. There have that been is lots of residents that are discussing says. it. I don't trust reporters and I don't trust police. You trust I, Trump? Yes. Okay. So again, Trump is a convicted felon. He has. Why is he a convicted felon? What do you mean? Why is he a convicted felon? I mean, why? What were the charges? Tax. I believe it was taxes with his company. He wasn't filing his taxes correctly. So business improprieties. Right. Exactly. I don't really that care is, about that. But that's the same person you want to run your economy. Yes, because that has he, no. As and we again, discussed in the previous segment, he did a great job running the economy. Just okay. Well, let me ask you. Let's this. go back to his character, though. Let's go back sure. to his character. Let's yeah. not get off topic. Again, he's a convicted felon. He has multiple accusations, which ha he has been. I don't know if he's been convicted of, but I know he has multiple accusations of sexual harassment. He's a known. And rapist. those have all failed. They have not all failed. They're they still going through. No, they've had to settle he in has, civil court because there's been no like with um uh, the one recently for like eighty something million dollars she had to pay out. It was found out that she had no evidence. There was okay. nothing there. Okay. And so. then one thing that has happened recently that I for me was just. It says it plays the day how he is. Mm -hmm. In a video, he made a statement. This was in Columbia, South Carolina. He said, "You have a black president and you have a white president. Who do I think? Who do they? Who do you think they want? They want the white president. To that is that is that is true. That is true. That is true. He did say that. He did say that. He did say that. He did say that. He did say that." How does that make you feel? Because that's completely irrelevant to the presidency, but he's bringing up race. And again, my issue with them is he has created such a divide in this country, one like we have never seen. Mm -hmm. How is that somebody you can sit here and say you want not only an office, but someone who has a good character? I don't feel like that is somebody who values me because, yes, I am black. Sure. And that is a part of my identity. That makes me who I am. You have to consider that. It is not white and black. It's not black and white. It's not. But for somebody to sit and actually say that the two things that make them different, his difference from Kamala is that he's white, and that's why the people want him, that's a dangerous ideology to spread. And we're going to end up recreating history yeah. if we let that continue, if we let him into office. I'm not, I'm not familiar with the comments you're referring to. Um, it sounds to me like it's just something Trump says offhand. But again, I don't know if you've ever been to a Trump rally. It's like the most Never. multiracial experience you'll ever have. No, it's not. It absolutely is. They're all white. They're all white in the is. background. No. And you look at, and too, he, what happened. I mean, Trump was doing initiatives trying to help uh, black Americans. Even in the 1990s, he was being honored by uh, initiatives to like increase black participation in business on Wall Street. And Trump has always gotten along very well with people of all backgrounds. It wasn't until, and a lot of people here are old enough to remember how beloved Trump was as a cultural icon he until had he ran and did for allow, president. He denied housing to black people. He, That's not true. Yes, it is. He had housing. He had housing. That's not and true. And he denied to black people. That's not true. <laughs> Hi, I'm from born and raised in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. New York. So I think I'm well versed to talk, comment on this, mm -hmm. okay? Trump is a racist. He's a narcissist, he's a con, and he's a liar, okay? He had buildings, he didn't allow black people to go in there. That's right? not true. Yes, it is not true. Not because of his race. I was a New Yorker, yes he was. He, four boys was wrongly convicted of a rape of uh, Central Park a, a Central Five. Park jogger. Yeah. He put they out, a, he paid $80,000 to have it advertised. Mm -hmm. I was there. Mm -hmm. I lived there. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the, the trauma that caused people in, in, in New York, we were, we couldn't, I have a brother the same age. We yeah. were scared to let our kids out because he put in an ad to put them to death. Because they were guilty. Kids. Kids. You know, they admitted they to being guilty. They were not guilty. guilty. Yes, they they were. got DNA. No, I'm serious. They were Look coerced. Up the Central Park Five. They were coerced because back then, the, the, um, the police force was kind of corrupt. They were coerced. They, because they were poor black boys living in the projects. Okay. Their parents could not afford a lawyer. Only one, Yusuf, mother, got mm -hmm. a lawyer who actually was a real estate or she was either Jamaican or African, got a real estate lawyer, not even a criminal lawyer, mm -hmm. right? And that's why he's the only one who didn't confess, okay? I, I was there. I remember it. You saw the central he did the, he I was living it. Okay. I lived I lived in New York. Okay. Okay. He is a racist that he will put an ad out on a paper to convict boys. What does race boys. have to do with it? 
He's a so he has. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if you're saying it's about race, I mean, if you hear a story about five boys doing that to a woman, what does race have to do with it? But wouldn't it, he do that about anybody? You're innocent until you're proven guilty. That's America. They were. That's yeah, they should have been proven guilty. Does he deserve to be murdered then? Because he's convicted of rape. He's not convicted of rape. He's convicted of rape. Okay. He's, he's a convicted. A He's, That's not true. He's a he he's abused women. He's he's he has no respect for women. He likes to have sex with them when he's married. He cheated on all his wives. Matter of fact, I forgot to mention his two wives were immigrants. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um he has no morals. No, he cares nothing about nobody but himself. He's a liar. He paid he had immigrants working for him and don't pay them. Okay. okay. I have a question then. So you're from New York, you've probably walked by Trump Tower. Think my about, father, my father union helped put the light fixture in Trump Tower, okay. and my father would say every day, this guy's an asshole. So why would you think then, Excuse my language. if Donald Trump, prior to getting involved in politics, he's living at the top of the skyscraper that's got his name on it, he's got, you know, supermodel wife, all this money coming in, why would he then enter into the realm of politics where every day people are mad at him, they're charging him with things, his net worth is going down, why would he go through all of that still now to where he's literally has assassination attempts if he didn't care about America? If he's doing it for himself, he would check out he's whenever, right? He's doing it for him, he likes to power, he likes to have power, that's but, all it is. But, he likes to be recognized, he likes to ha he likes to have the power, that's all it is. What power that's though? All it is I mean, he him. wasn't able to get anything done, he's right? a so narcissist. What power does he, really have? he just likes to. He, he incited the the, in, um, the um, capital getting because he likes the power that he has. These people just running to him mm. when he says something. Yes, you know he likes to have that power. How you doing, sir? John, nice to meet you. Oh, here talking about the character. Right? Yes, sir. Yeah, uh, well, I, I believe Donald Trump is is an okay character myself. Mm -hmm. uh, we both share the same birthdays. And I, and I, I, I also believe, uh, uh, sorry for saying, but we as black people, we get caught up on the wrong candidates. Yeah. Like, I think we forget like Kamala Harris, the vice president. Mm -hmm. So what, if she become president, what would change? Is she already the vice president? And yeah. I do feel like when uh, Trump was in office, I feel like it was a better economy and, yeah. and things for us, you know? And, and another thing, Kamala Harris also uh, locked up a lot of, African American for possession of weed, like just yeah, yeah. I, and I think we forget about that. So yeah, they. Yeah. Uh, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I gonna... appreciate you, man. Yeah. I'm gonna bring race into it. Four hundred years of slavery, um, and also oh sorry, also just like the history of America. I don't even have to go that far deep, but why is it such a big deal? If the first woman and the first black woman runs the country when y'all have fucked it up for so many years, hundreds of years, I don't understand that. So do you think then that like everything that's happened in American history in terms of politics is all a monolith of white people? Majority, yes. And white people all act the same, have the same interests, and no, we not, messed it up so the, badly? Not the same interests, but like I will say white men are accustomed to they are accustomed to telling and not listening. I think that's a dangerous route to go down because if you start saying something like, okay, look at the white people in charge of this country, look how no, badly they fact, messed though. it up. Well, you look at non-white people in charge of other countries in the world and nobody wants to go live there and everyone wants to come live here. So again, if you start keeping score, you can get to some pretty scary conclusions, which I would disagree with, but. I think my whole point is that like. We want to focus on character though for, yeah. there's a little bit of a. Two minutes. So could you just tell me for a second the top three positive attributes of Donald Trump that you think make him an excellent leader specifically? Sure. Um, incredible resilience, charisma, uh, and transparency. Can I ask you a question about that? Um, transparency. Yep. Uh, that's an inter interesting word to use specifically for someone who isn't even transparent with the person they pick to be their spouse. Do you think that if you pick a spouse and then have to go cheat on them, do you think that you're very good at judging other people's character? Yeah, I'm not really concerned with like tabloid gossip. I'm concerned about the border being wide open and the economy. 
Um, Do you, you know, think one it's thing, tabloid gossip if there's absolutely. physical evidence of absolutely. it? Absolutely. And one thing I would say, though, just to, I guess, wrap this up, we've heard a lot about Trump's character like we have for the last 10 years, which, again, he was a beloved cultural figure. It was only Beloved when, by whom? Everybody. He was, I'm from Connecticut, and I can the, tell you that New England hates Donald he Trump. He had the highest rated shows. Everybody loved Trump. And now what we're seeing is these character oh. assassinations by the character media. Character assassinations? Absolutely. So I guess I would just ask you this. Okay, if Trump's character is the worst, sure. Why do you trust the character of somebody like Kamala Harris or Joe Biden, people who have been career politicians, who have been in charge of this country as it's seen its decline? Kamala Harris is a prosecutor. I trust a prosecutor to do the job of a prosecutor over a felon to do the job of a felon. Kamala do Harris. you think that it is American exceptionalism to have a felon representing our country? I think Donald in Trump is American exceptionalism. Domestic and foreign yeah. relations. Yeah. Do you think that's something you're proud of? I'm proud of Donald Trump. You're sure. proud. So you yeah. support felons being CEOs and executives. That's what you want to see. Use, that's the America you exceptional use the word, America. You, you use see. the word felon to invoke imagery of scary crime. No, I'm just asking you. Tax impropriety. I'm asking you. With is all of that, these, like, you think those are the people that are going to uphold democratic values of honesty, respect, yes. American exceptionalism. You think someone who is yeah. actively engaged in lying and fraud Which is going not. to do those things? Which is not, and he Even has, and he does. Been, he's been, he's are, he's literally in in legal, like legal. He's in in the legal preparation right now. We just don't know how many counts he's going to be guilty of. Right. And the reason for that, like with all the other persecution against Donald Trump, isn't because they finally persecution? found... Persecution? Excuse me, miss. Isn't because they finally found the one person in politics who's corrupt. I think everybody in this room would agree that D.C. is a swamp and everybody there is in it for themselves, at least for the most part. What's weird to me is that Donald Trump would get in there saying he wants to drain the swamp. And all of a sudden, we would see an unprecedented level of persecution, be that slander in the media, be that legal persecution, physical persecution against his safety with assassination attempts. All that, which none of us have seen in our lifetimes. So I've for seen that it to in make my sense, lifetime, my mom was murdered during the sense, Trump presidency, for and that nothing to make has sense, been done about it. So that, I've seen what Trump, Donald Trump has been responsible for under his presidency. Because of Trump, your mom. And it, my mom is dead. Donald Trump is not. Okay. He's very much alive. Okay. Very much. So again, in terms of Trump's character, uh, we're talking about somebody who seems to have sacrificed safety, sacrificed? money. Yes, safety, A trust fund baby money. sacrificed what exactly? Literally billions of dollars. What his has net he worth, sacrificed in his entire life? Billions of dollars. His net worth has billions? decreased. Billions? Every business he's ever yes. had has went bankrupt. Yes. Okay. Thank you. John, nice, nice to, meet, to you. meet you. Donald Trump is very clear that he is pro-life and against women's reproductive rights. Ever since Roe v. Wade has been overturned, there's been an increase in the number of babies being abandoned and left in dumpsters, the number of women who have died because they've been denied an abortion, the number of disabilities, babies born with disabilities, and Donald Trump does not care. So without Roe v. Wade being overturned or nothing no plan to overturn it. What what do you care about women and their rights? Uh, well, nobody cares more about women and their rights than myself, except for maybe Donald Trump. I should lead with that. But I would also say that it sounds to me like if there are instances where women are putting their babies inside of dumpsters, that seems to me less of a problem with Donald Trump and more of a problem with those women. And I think they should be held accountable for that. Um, if your position is that, you know, as a matter of policy, we should either have the ability to kill our baby in utero. And if we can't do that, then we'll kill it in a dumpster. That seems to me like, again, more of a problem with people than Donald Trump specifically. I said an increase in. Sure. This has been happening over time. And the whole argument is that abortion is murder, but mm -hmm. lives are being ruined. Let people are dying. Babies are dying more now than they were before. That's definitely not true. If, if by definition, a baby's dying during abortion, then of course that's going to happen more when abortion is the law of the land, um, which Donald Trump, you know, he appointed the justices. Roe was overturned, which should have been done simply because it was a bad case. It was unconstitutional. And now states have the right to, you know, make their own laws. And so some states have gone more... John. So would you say that you're pro-life? Sure. I think the issue with that phrase is that after abortion bans and abortion bans in Texas are very strict. Mm -hmm. And since 2021, 2022, uh, 
the rise in infant deaths has gone up 11% in Texas as opposed to 1% nationwide, and maternal deaths has gone up 50% uh, in Texas as opposed to 11% nationwide. Maternal mortality and uh, morbidity are very much on the rise in Texas, so mm -hmm. I think that there is very clearly not life in, in that abortion ban. Yeah, you know, I the phrase pro-life is a PR thing, um, so I understand why it's sometimes silly for people to say, I'm so pro-life, but then you look at where that might manifest across the board, and it's like, okay, well, clearly you're not. Um, so I understand that concern. I would just say that I think it's a false binary where we have to choose between either what you're describing, which I would have to look into because I'm unfamiliar with, or we simply have abortion access and women are able to terminate uh, their children in utero, which I don't think is a good solution either. You know, if you're describing a situation where people feel like so tormented by the idea of a pregnancy that they're willing to uh, abort the child or they're willing to go to the extent of throwing him or her in a dumpster or killing it or the whatever, those seem to be issues more of the economy or of uh, healthcare policy, things like that. And abortion seems to be something that's downstream from that, which is why, to be honest with you, in 2024, I'm looking at what Donald Trump is saying, and he's really not talking about this issue, um, which a lot of conservatives even are upset about. They're mad at him because he's not being more hardline. He's not endorsing um, an idea of like a federal abortion ban. He's saying that he wouldn't be in favor of that. And to me, that makes sense because it's like, if you're Donald Trump, you're trying to make it easier for American families to grow, to exist. And what you're describing seems to be less of a problem with abortion policy more of a problem with whatever's going on in this country that would make people think the idea of a pregnancy is so bad that they would have to resort to such extreme measures to deal with it as opposed to simply raising a child, which I think most people would say is you know, the highlight of their lives. I agree that raising a child can be the highlight of lives for a lot of people, but there are also a lot of circumstances where a child can very much set you back in life. Teen pregnancies, uh, or if a woman has been raped by a man, Incest, right. everything, and uh, but you're I describing like one percent of cases. If you look at even the, the Gutmacher Institute, I believe it's pronounced, which keeps it's a pro-choice institute, which keeps data on this. Uh, upwards of ninety-five percent of all abortions are done for reasons of convenience. Things like women just feel like you know they'd rather go work, they'd rather go to school than to have a child. That's absolutely true. And what I would ask you is this: like, if we're okay, so let's say we have President Kamala Harris. We continue the last four years, and then we also have uh, a restoration of what people call abortion rights. What are you even pursuing? Let's say you have the right to kill your child. What are you pursuing now uh, if everything else is going into the toilet? If the economy continues to suck, if the country is more dangerous, it's being flooded from people, uh, we don't even know where they're coming from. Like, was this really worth it? This is your great opportunity to go get some service job, to drive for Uber, to fill out some Excel spreadsheet because you can't get a good job anymore because the country is going down the toilet. That's all worth it if it means that you have the right for some reason to kill your child. I don't buy that as like a, a sort of pro-con. I don't think that's real. I just believe that there should fully be the right and option opportunity to save your life if you're trying to deliver a stillborn child. Um, you should not be forced to go through with that. There are medical instances where an abortion needs to be performed in order to save the life of the mother, even if it's just 1% of a case, even if the rape cases are just 1% of the case, I believe there should fully be the opportunity for that institution. But what you're describing is a case where the baby has to be delivered. And what will happen is they will deliver the child. And if the child has a chance of being viable and surviving, they will not provide to that child medical care. They will literally let it die there in the hospital or wherever um, as a matter of policy, as opposed to then trying to support that life. But again, we're talking about one in every thousand, one in every 10,000 cases. And the reason I don't like that is not because I discount the circumstances surrounding that, but because what tends to happen is people say, well, what if this really horrible thing happened that would justify this? And they use that to then allow for complete whatever you want, whatever reason, as a matter of policy. Um, and I just I disagree with that on every level. Okay, I'll get up here. Nice speaking with you. How you doing, young man? <clears throat> Still doing good. I need for you to pay close attention to what I'm about to say. Undivided. <clears throat> My wife. Just found out my mistress pregnant. And I need to know where abortion clinics at close by here. Can you help me with that? So if I, let me make sure I heard you correctly. Your wife has discovered that your mistress is pregnant and you're asking me if I know what to do in that situation. You for abortion, right? Pro-life? 
I think that, like, obviously, you know, you may have gotten yourself into a little bit of a pickle there. My name is Angel, by the way. So just want to introduce myself. Hi, that's what I would have mm -hmm. guessed. I would have thought. Yeah. Angelic, something yes, like that. Yes, very sweet. My name yes. is Angel, everybody. <laughs> um, so have you ever uh, known of any specific examples in which the government is making specific decisions around men's reproductive rights in particular? And if so, could you tell me a little bit about those specific examples and what happened? Um, when you say reproductive rights, can mm -hmm. you maybe elaborate on that a little like bit? Like men's right to impregnate women, because statistically and scientifically speaking, a man can go out and impregnate a woman literally all day, every day. Sure. So when we think about that compared to women, a woman, it takes nine months for a child yeah. to reach, you know, obviously viability. Yeah. So my Well, not viability. I mean, there have been babies who've been delivered uh, like halfway standard viability is considered eight to nine months. So sure. you have to hold a baby inside of you for that period of time in order to have it. So a woman can't go out and get repregnant while she's already pregnant is the point I'm making. Correct. Sure. Yep. But a man can go out and get as many women as he wants pregnant. Correct. Mm -hmm. In his lifetime, yep. all the way up until he dies. Sure. Okay. So then my question is, do you know of any examples in which the government in America specifically has been making any kind of decisions as it relates to men's right to reproduce freely? You know, I would take that and kind of extend it a little bit where the government does get involved in uh, quite heavily with the man's right to remain in the lives of the children he does produce. And so that is certainly of concern. Um, if it's an issue of gender, I mean, you look at the men who discovered that right in the Constitution, supposedly for women to do that, those Supreme Court justices were all men. And they decided that somehow in the Constitution there's a right to an abortion, which of course is absurd, which is why we no longer believe that. Um, but I don't think it matters so much about um, the experience of this gender versus the other gender. The question is, is it morally per uh, permissible and should we allow, as a matter of policy in this country, women to pursue these things? Which again, I don't think, you know, Bill Clinton, even in the 90s, took the line that they should be safe, right, right legal there. and rare. Rare implying that this is not the best situation. I think there are a lot of things we could do which could reduce the instances of this happening that wouldn't require the kinds of procedures you're describing. OK, so going off of that idea, do you know anyone that's been adopted or that's had an abortion? Sure. And those people who've been adopted, what sort of outcomes did they have in life? Uh, normal. Were they also Caucasian by chance uh, or Eastern European? The descent? three I'm thinking of, uh, two are Caucasian. Uh, one is not. OK, uh, every person that I know that was adopted, including my mother, mm -hmm. has met an untimely end, meaning that their life was full of turmoil, meaning mm -hmm. that they were brought into this world without any sort of safety nets. Okay. The majority of people serving time and incarcerated right now in this country are people that are products of the adoption or the or the or the uh, the foster care system. So with that in mind, do you really think that the right to life actually guarantees that people will have a good life if they're not wanted? I think it's very convenient for us to sit here and decide people's risk aversion for them. I think any person here, you know, as much crap as we may have been through, ultimately, if we could go back and decide whether or not we want to be born, I think most people would probably prefer to be born. Uh, I can honestly say that born. as a child of an adopted individual, I would make the choice to not be here over being here and being traumatized. I would. Right. I think a lot of your positions are informed by these sorts of things in your past. And, again, you know, we're focused on the future. We're focused on the election. And uh, I just don't think that Donald Trump is really making this an issue of his Would campaign. Would you trust Donald Trump to give birth to a baby and be responsible for a woman's entire eight to nine months of pregnancy? And if you asked me to bet on if Trump could deliver a baby, I would not make that bet. No. OK, so do you think then it is it is responsible or respectable or that it makes any kind of logical sense for him to be? Hello, um, let me ask you a question. Sure. Um, if the government were to say that all men were required to, oh, actually, let me start here. Why are you pro-life? Um, I don't believe that it is morally correct as a Catholic to okay. be able to terminate uh, a, a live being in the womb just because you think it's like convenient for whatever reason. I don't think that's a right that's guaranteed. I don't think that you should be able to do that. Okay. Um, I think it's a stain on this country. Okay, so I'm a Catholic as well. Um, and with that being said, how- You're pro-choice? 
Yes. Let me finish. You can only Let be me one. finish. I am pro-choice. No, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. I am a woman. I will not be told what to do with my body. Not and by the Pope? Who no. you have to no. listen to as a Catholic? No. no. Okay. Can I finish? Yes. So if the government were to say every male should have a vasectomy at the age of 16, and then when they, as a devout Catholic, right? As a Catholic, right? Let me finish. As a Catholic, you cannot have a child outside of marriage, correct? So to protect that Catholicism, that standard of Catholicism, yep. every male has a vasectomy. And then once they get married, it is reversed. If that was a law that the government put in place to lower abortion, for yeah. example, how would that make you feel? Uh, as a Catholic, I have to oppose that because, as you know, as a Catholic, we oppose sterilization in sex, meaning sex has to have the possibility of creating life. And if you, which is why Catholics are also against a separation uh, of church and state, though. I'm not in, like I'm not including. Well, you asked me as a Catholic if I would support that. And separation of church and state is a, a whole other thing, which I think is a misleading sort of okay. um, political talking point. But yeah, we believe that sex has to have the possibility of creating life, which is why we don't support vasectomies, we don't support birth control, things like that. The problem seems to be that people want to live as they will. And then when the consequence of sex occurs, which is the conception of a child, they instead of wanting to deal with that responsibly, they want to place that burden onto the child itself and say, well, I have so many things I want to do. And so I should be able to just go get rid of the child and kill it so that I can continue living my life, which is so great. And I think that that's very immoral. Immoral. So at, at the time of conception, do you, do you agree with um, chemotherapy? Let me ask you that. Do you agree with chemotherapy? Do you believe in chemotherapy as a treatment for cancer? Sure. Because it's killing cells, correct? Sure. So if a woman has an abortion in the mm. first trimester, that child outside of the womb is not viable. It cannot sustain life on its own. Right. What is the difference between a clump of cells, cancer, and the fetus that is also not viable outside? Like, I want to understand why yeah. we are okay with killing cells in this situation, but in this situation where a woman who does want to, to achieve a higher education, get a job, and having a baby would stop her from doing that because she then also has to get a job on this side, stop going to school. She's now kept in place and she cannot do anything. Yeah. Why are you so opposed to that? And just also why as a male are you so opposed to women? Women collectively are saying that we want the choice. There is no harm in the choice. A woman who is Catholic who believes, okay, as a Catholic, I'm going to have this child because that's what my religion says, do it. But if this woman wants to go and get a higher paying job, but that child is going to stop her, why not let her? I would say in terms of viability, I don't think that that's a relevant metric to establish life because I mean, there are, but it. there are plenty of people who we would maybe say aren't viable because their cognitive state is perhaps declined. Like Biden, um, they're not like capable. Biden. Like Biden, I wasn't going to go there. What about his cognitive decline? You know, he's a stable genius. He is not a stable so genius. I don't think that he's that's a good measure for genius. establishing the viability, um, or excuse me, the, the dignity of people, whether or not we should just kill them. Um, in terms of the cells, I mean, the difference being the cells that are in the woman's body are new cells. Those are created because life begins at conception. So those cells life are not does hers. Not begin at conception. It, it absolutely it does. does. Every that biologist will tell you that. cannot sustain itself outside. But there's of plenty the of people we would say are alive who also cannot sustain themselves. Children cannot sustain themselves. If you abandon them, they will die and you will be charged for the crime. People well, are not viable until they're happening. years old or something like that. I mean, again, it gets very iffy when you start to try to draw a hard line. The cells that are in the woman's body are new DNA that is created. That that is a new life. The cells you're referring to are cells that match my DNA already or your DNA since you're a woman. So it's when not the same. you say they're same. new cells, egg, a woman is born with all her eggs. Yes. Okay. But so upon, when you say when the baby is formed, when the sperm and the egg. When conception occurs uh -huh. and yes, you it is created. Them, yes. Exactly. That's new DNA. Okay. If you yes, took that yes. and measured it versus, you know, a cotton swab from you, it would be different because it is different. It's a different being that has been created through that process. And I think terminating that because of convenience, like you mentioned, you want a higher paying job is deeply That's selfish. Not convenience. Not That's my right. That's my right. That's my and freedom. That's something that should sway an election with so much at stake. <laughs>
And if he's going to speak like a bully, it ain't going to work. Again, you know, we understand sort of what we're signing on to with Donald Trump, with his comments and the things that he'll say. Um, I'm more concerned about the things that he does. And under Trump's administration, we had energy independence. You know, we weren't dependent upon these other countries necessarily for oil or for things like that. Um, whereas, you know, under different administrations, we become less energy independent. Costs go up and lives get worse for people over here in America. So I think with foreign policy, you know, we touched on the economy. We touched on trade. I would like to keep the discussion more focused on things like, you know, war, um, dealings with other nations diplomatically. And I look at the state of the world now, and I think it's objectively less safe and more in, uh, unstable than it was under Trump's presidency. Um, you know, Trump likes to say that he didn't start any new wars. That's actually true. He's the first president in my lifetime, or even you know, my dad's lifetime, to not get us involved in new foreign conflicts. He actually pulled us out of um, large portions of the Middle East, including Syria, which was against the interest of the establishment in Washington because. Um, the establishment in Washington has wanted to pursue a policy of regime change in Syria because they want more instability in the Middle East, which is where, like we said earlier, we've been for literally the entire century so far. And I don't support that. I don't think Americans support that. And Donald Trump is the only one who's willing to go against the grain on that. How you doing, young man? Great since we last spoke. Yeah, <laughs> you hanging in there. Yes, sir. Hey, um... Uh... Speaking of the war, mm -hmm. I have nieces and nephews coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you do to see that there will not be a draft? Yeah, I, I think that's a, a concern for anybody who's, you know, roughly my age or the age of your nieces and nephews. Um, simply, like, not get us involved in more foreign conflicts, basically. Um, I mean, it sounds simple, but that's true. I mean, any situation where you would need to institute something like a draft would require America being imminently under attack. And so long as we can prevent that, I mean, we wouldn't need to have something like that happen. Um, and I think Donald Trump has a very clear cut peace through strength kind of foreign policy, which is why under Donald Trump, America wasn't being attacked. Allies weren't being attacked. We crushed ISIS. We reduced our involvement in the Middle East. And there was a more uh, peaceful, it was a safer world. And then in two years of the Joe Biden administration, you see Russia invade Ukraine. You see now the conflict between right. Israel and Palestine popping off. So we're dealing with multiple theaters now all asking America, what are you going to do? So we send them hundreds of billions of dollars, American military equipment. These are not things that Donald Trump wanted to get involved in. I mean, you can look back his public statements, even when the Iraq war you know, was beginning in 2003, he was against it. So um, I think if you're looking to reduce the risk of family members having to go die for a country that's not even theirs, right. you need to support a president who does not have an interest in war. And unfortunately, Donald Trump is the only option we have for that in terms of he's the only politician in my lifetime who has come out against those wars, be those Republicans or Democrats. Everybody was pro involvement in the Middle East until Donald Trump got up there and said to Jeff. Bush, George Bush's brother, he told him in that debate in 2016, the towers came down under your brother, your brother made us less safe, the war was a big fat mistake. That's career suicide for any other Republican politician. Donald Trump pulled it off because he had his own money and he was a household name already. But nobody in Republican politics dared to speak out against these foreign wars and tell Donald Trump, which is why under Trump's presidency, we didn't see these escalations. We didn't see this destabilization the way you see it now because the establishment likes war. It's very profitable for a lot of people. And so Trump is the only one I think who can move against the grain on that, which is what he did. So you can honestly say we got the technology military technology where we, where we won't need boots on the ground. You know, modern warfare is definitely a lot different. Um, if we did have something like, God forbid, a actual traditional war where America's going and, you know, doing stuff, then yeah, I'm sure we'd have boots on the ground, but you'd also have drones, you'd have sanctions, you'd have things like that. But um, where, you know, your fam family members would be drafted, um, that would require an extreme scenario, which I think could only be prevented by basically having a president who's respected and not laughed at. I mean, you saw Chinese diplomats, you saw Russian diplomats, they're making fun of Joe Biden because they understood that his cognitive state wasn't quite there. You know, right. people look at the commander in chief, the leader of the armed forces, and you might not like Donald Trump's rhetoric, but that's a guy who under you understand he can sort of back up what he's talking about in terms of you mess around with us, you're going to face consequences, which is why, um, you know, in 2020 or when 2019 was wrapping up, you saw there were militias in the Middle East and they went and they attacked the United States embassy. They were taking pictures with our seal. They were making fun of it. 
Three days later, Donald Trump blew up the second most powerful guy in Iran. And everybody said, oh, he's done it now. There's going to be World War III. And what did Iran do? They threw some missiles in the general direction of some of our military bases. And they caused some concussions for guys over there. But they didn't do anything else because these countries are little chihuahuas. And you need somebody who can not get involved with them, but who can let them know that we're not going to be pushed around anymore. And because of that, they won't act in ways that put American lives at risk, which, again, is what we saw under Donald Trump. We're seeing the All opposite right. now under Joe Biden. So, um, <clears throat> you know, I have a sister-in-law who's in the Army. I have a friend who's in the Marines. Mm -hmm. And while um, President Obama was in office, uh, he did get deployed a couple times to fight in the Middle East. And um, I just want to know, what is the plan or strategy to keep military here, mm -hmm. but to also prevent foreign countries from essentially coming after us? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's the first thing that I would sure. like to know. Um, so a large, like when I was growing up, for example, one of the things that I would always hear, which I'm sure everyone here has heard a million times, is that we have to fight them over, he over there so that we don't have to fight them over here. And it was a way of justifying involvement in the Middle East by basically saying these people hate us because we're just so great. And if we don't go fight them over here, then they're going to come and commit acts of terrorism in America. And then we're all going to have to deal with that. It turns out that's not actually how it works. Um, they don't hate us because, you know, we're just so great. USA number one. They hate us because we're involved in their countries trying to institute forms of government, which they just don't want unless we're over there literally at gunpoint forcing them to be involved in these things. And so Donald Trump, when he was running in 2016, he basically made three promises promises in terms of foreign policy. He said he wanted to crush ISIS. He said he wanted to long-term get us out of the Middle East, and he wanted to specifically uh, not continue DC's policy of regime change in Syria, because the Syrian civil war was going on at the time under the Obama administration it began. And what the United States was doing literally was we were giving uh, money and we were giving weapons to these militias who were fighting against the Assad regime because we thought it would be better for the interests of America to take Assad out of power and have Syria more destabilized and things of that nature. And Trump was actually the one who broke free from that. Um, he said, that, no, we're not going to do that. That's so stupid because we're fighting ISIS, and then we're also fighting guys who are also fighting ISIS. And so he took us out of Syria and reduced the risk of American personnel being attacked there. And then you look at the way the media thanked him for that. They said, this is Donald Trump's gift to Moscow because Vladimir Putin was also with the Assad regime fighting these people in Syria. And so they said, well, Trump must be a, a Russian puppet. That's why he's doing this. When in actuality, it's because we have no business being in the Middle East. I mean, we don't get anything from it. We don't even, like we said earlier, get the oil from it. It's just a big fat mistake. And so Trump has been able to simultaneously pull us out of those conflicts while protecting Americans. I mean, when's the last time anybody here heard about a terrorist attack from ISIS? I mean, he crushed them, killed the leader, um, and it just simply ceased to be an issue. In our no, because of the open border. No, uh, al-Baghdadi was killed by Trump. He died like a dog. Um, you can see the monologue. It's quite funny the way Trump articulates it, actually. But yeah, Donald Trump was able to. That's it's not even the same thing. Not even the same thing. We're talking about foreign policy. So, yeah, I mean, um, I have great respect for anybody who's involved in the military. But the other side of that is I don't want to see them have to go fight if it's not for their interest. And the best way to keep us safe is to just stop getting involved in stupid fights, which, again, Trump is the first president in our lifetime to actually take that position. I think the bottom line is that, like, when you say, like, destabilize all these little chihuahua countries and all of this stuff, I think it just comes down to stealing and exploiting these countries. It's no way that like, because America is a great country when it comes to the whole aspect of not dealing with a lot of things and clean water, just, you know, basic life necessity. But sure. when it comes to exploiting people, especially like, you know, like you say, third world countries, yeah, um, it's because you guys overtake a lot. And, um, oh, like, don't replace, don't, don't, um, don't give the money that's needed for what you're taking, like those resources, that coton, that um, just whatever. You know what I mean? So I don't think I follow. Are you, you're saying that America is wealthy because we're stealing resources of from course, other countries? 100%. I don't think that's true. Yeah, hundred percent true. No, I as mean, somebody who, I, as somebody who has immigrants in their family, I can confirm that like kids that do uh, child, you know, labor and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Coton and all of that stuff, that important mineral for that pretty, pretty iPhone that everybody has. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. It's a lot of it's a lot of it's a lot of stealing and exploiting going on. So. so they're working in those countries, and that's somehow Americans' fault because we want to buy the products of their labor. No, it's it's not that. It's the it's not buying the products. It's more so using the kids for that labor and not properly compensating them. American doesn't do. We have child. I couldn't get a job until I was sixteen because we have child labor laws. Yeah, and right, but we're talking, countries, we're talking about different. America, though. We're talking about American yeah. foreign policy. But I'm, but I'm saying when you say like the whole, the whole Syria war and all of this stuff, like there's a reason, and we know it's it's something. But it's just one of those things where like I feel like if you're going to do something and call yourself the greatest country, do it with dignity and yeah. not bring other nations down. This is not the fire nation and water, earth, and air nation. It's just, you know what I mean? Just at the bottom. So it's like Avatar. Yeah, that's what, that's what it's like. America is the fire nation and the rest is like just... I think that, uh, you know, even yeah. one of the things that Trump complained about in 2016 is that we went to the Middle East and we didn't even take the oil. Yeah. So if what you were saying is true, I honestly no, wouldn't I'm have a problem with that. I'm not worried about Middle East. I'm African. Middle okay. East don't have no oil like us. I'm an American, yeah. so I don't really care about no, Middle I'm, East I'm or just, Africa no, either. No, I was just, I'm just letting you know that like, when you say when when you use a word like a tiny country or all of this yeah. to make it seem like it's just like nothing, there's a reason why people are going over there. Rather you know it or I know it, it's just like there is some type of exploit exploiting going on. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I I just um, I feel that Trump wants to be a dictator. Because mm -hmm. he's that's his his thing. He's a narcissist. He likes the power. He doesn't really care about nothing but being the man, mm. trying to be a leader. He didn't. He, Obama was the one who got uh, Obama. Oh, oh, Biden. Biden. He's the one who got that. Trump doesn't care. He wants to be like Putin. We have to protect our allies. Okay, and that's what we're doing right now. Okay, for humanity. Right. People are trying to bully like how he's bullying. He's a bully. It sounds what you're saying uh, like very nice, but I don't understand why it's in America's interest to send $200 billion to Ukraine. Um, so Russia doesn't get it. Russia doesn't claim it. And then Russia will go down and then Russia will start getting every other place and they get bigger and bigger and bigger. That's why we have. You think that Russia made, wants to take had, over the we, world? We, we, we did a deal, whereas we partnered with countries to help protect each other and stuff. And right. so if um if um, Putin gets Ukraine, he's starting to take over. You think he's going to take over the world? That's what he's trying to do. He's, okay. a, he's a dictator. He's a dictator. Um, I think that that is just simply not accurate. I don't think that Putin has any aspiration to what he was trying to do. You and, don't think so? No, what he's trying to do is reclaim territory that was formerly part of like the Russian Empire historically, but he's not trying to take over the world like some cartoon character or something he's like trying that. To, yes, he's trying to take over the land. He's trying to move over here and he's trying to be a, he's trying to be a dictator. Okay. He's trying to, he's trying to get all the countries around Ukraine to try to get more power. Mm -hmm. That's what uh, uh, Trump wants. He wants power. He likes power. So he really, really loves Putin. He likes the idea of being a dictator, having that much power, having all that strength and stuff. That's what he's on. He's on. He's he he just has. He just likes power. Look how he's so talking about a, a day of love when an insurrection on a capital. A day of love. Well, yeah, People I mean, died. it was a riot that got out of control. No, it wasn't a riot. It wasn't? He, com he commanded. No, he didn't. He commanded that. He didn't mean he didn't do it. He, he did, did not tell people to go into the Capitol. Yes, he did. He no, said, he come to the Capitol. He said, yes, he yes, did. Yes, walk peacefully to the Capitol no, is different from the riot not. that he broke said, out. He said, we're going to fight. We're going to fight. You got to fight. Everybody says that he word said, in we politics. Have to fight. Kamala Harris says that word. So when it comes to corruption, um, so so, uh, so Kamala, Kamala Harris was raising him is was a make uh, a middle class working family. Yeah, and as to where uh, Donald Trump may have been privileged in other as in some aspects of his life. Mm -hmm. So would you think that somebody's morale, somebody's morale or their thought processes may be derived? Uh, differently within within how they were raised and the way they came up? I think it could be, but I don't know if it's necessarily a, a guarantee of if they're going to be corrupt or not. Um, I think that career politicians such as Kamala Harris have a much higher likelihood of being corrupt, which is why they're able to climb the political ladder, which we all know is so rotten, as opposed to people who make money in Manhattan real estate or television shows or things of that nature. Sure. So, so um, but you don't think like their, their mindset is going to be for 
be uh, people who have less than, uh, than, than themselves? It could be, um, you know, if you took a uh, hundred billionaires versus a hundred middle class people and saw, you know, who has a mind to accommodate for, you know, people with less, I would guess maybe you would see something like that. But again, you know, we saw what Trump did in office and he was putting money back into the pockets of working class families, of middle class families. Um, and we mentioned this during the economy segment, it was a 40% increase in lower class family net worth. You saw like $6,000 go back into the pockets of middle class families because of his tax cut act. Um, so Donald Trump does seem to have an idea that people should be able to afford more and to keep more of their own money. Um, and so while it might be as simple as to say, well, he's rich, what does, he, what does he know about me? If you look at what he actually does and how he actually talks to people and also who his biggest supporters are, you go to a Trump rally, you don't see guys you know, dressed in suits like me, you see like, people who look like they just got off you know, the line or something. These are guys who are like middle class, working class, and you drive anywhere out, you, know, you get out of the city, you get into not even the suburbs, but like rural areas, they're flying Trump flags, Trump signs, Trump bumper stickers, because they view Trump to be somebody who is going to represent them, somebody who is going to actually be a voice for them, um, because these people are largely checked out of politics before Trump, which is why you, know, you had so many first time voters who were voting for Trump in 2016, because they live their lives, they see you know, some guy in a red tie says this, some guy in a blue tie says this, but the country's losing jobs, we're losing wealth, things are getting worse, and Trump comes along finally with a new message, which maybe you don't like it, but it's a new message, and finally those people feel like they have some sort of political representation, which is why you know, this segment's about democracy and corruption, things like that. I think that in a way, the election of Donald Trump is one of the most democratic things to happen in this nation's history, accurately representing the will of the people. There, there, so it's my personal belief that there's minorities out there that, that, uh, that, that may believe that due to his pompous, uh, uh, his pompous persona, his arrogance, mm -hmm. his demeanor, he's, he's very unbecoming he's, and they find it very standoffish and it's, it's unwelcoming uh, on, for these minorities that are out there. So um, do, you think, uh, do you think he could be a little more empathetic with the American people or do you think that's impossible? I personally think it's impossible. I think, I don't know, I mean, you know, I wouldn't say that Donald Trump isn't empathetic. I think he certainly has an ego about him, but I mean, any example in Trump's life where he was in proximity to disaster, I mean, even on September 11th, he was down at ground zero, putting his guys to work, trying to find people, cleaning up de uh, debris and rubble. Um, you know, he meets with all sorts, of, he meets with the victims of uh, people who have been killed by illegal aliens. He does all sorts of things to extend those olive branches to minority groups, the First Step Act, different things like that. And so um, I think that maybe he speaks away that is sometimes off-putting to people, but I don't think that means that he has some cold heart and he doesn't actually care about people other than himself. I'll think otherwise, thank you. Yes, he was. You can see the footage. Yes, he was. So just to I guess, start off the conversation, how do you feel about January 6th and then the 2020 presidential election? Well, I think that January 6th was uh, a day where a riot occurred and things got a little bit out of hand. And I think that the 2020 election was uh, fortified such that Trump didn't really have a fair shot. So when he says that he didn't lose the election and J.D. Vance also affirms that he didn't lose the election, uh, would you agree that he um, had the election stolen from him? Or do you think it was simply that uh, there were things that kind of may have influenced people's uh, electoral outcomes. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that like there were Dominion voting machines that were rigged and hacked and everything like that. You don't want to be sued, I'm assuming. Yeah, well, and we do have to be careful because of uh, the way that YouTube may handle things. But um, I think that there was advantage taken of voter registration rolls and mail-in ballots and things like that, which produced outcomes which were statistically impossible in areas that Trump was expected to perform well in. And ultimately, uh, we had a result that was something that was like just completely unexpected. Um, he was winning all the bellwethers um, and you had like record turnouts in counties, which that wasn't supposed to occur in. And uh, yeah, it was just an environment which I think was completely um, illegitimate. Yeah. So, I mean, we could go through like the evidence surrounding um, like election fraud or anything surrounding that with the 65 cases that none of which went in his favor. You can talk about the audit that occurred in Arizona with all the issues in Maricopa County that were uh, started with uh, Trump supporters that ultimately affirmed the results. In fact, it actually showed that Biden won by greater margin than we initially expected. So when we look at the 65 cases or you look at like the audits that occurred in states like Arizona, for example, how I'm come nothing in defends this, this idea so, that it was stolen from him? Because in 2024, which is the election we're discussing, I mean, we're talking about corruption and democracy. You actually think that Kamala Harris is a more democratic, meaning she represents and can execute the will of the people, and she's less corrupt, meaning she's less self-interested than Donald Trump. Do you think that's true? Wait, so just to clarify, 
how does this have to do with January 6th and the 2020 election? I thought that's what we were talking about. We're talking about the 2024 election. That's the question of the whole discussion. I mean, well, if, I mean you, I've, if, if you want to bring up historical an anecdotes to say, well, Trump is anti-democratic because a riot broke out at the Capitol. I understand that line of thought, but ultimately we're not going to get anywhere with that. Well, he tried to overturn the results of the election by true. reaching out to representatives in Arizona and he Georgia. He tried to litigate his way to a victory the same way that Al Gore did in 2000. I mean, there's a precedent for this in this country. Well, I think it was a little bit different with Al Gore. He obviously didn't lead his supporters to um, the Capitol on January 6th, uh, nor did he try to send like fake ele elector, uh, it's a fake elector scheme that Trump obviously had set up. And, you know, I'm assuming you saw the Jack Smith uh, document that was uh, uncut sure. released. So then you would admit that there was representatives from Arizona, for example, that uh, reached out to Giuliani or Giuliani reached out to them. And he tried to make them not certify the results. And when asked for evidence, he didn't have any. He said that they only had uh, theories and no evidence to support the claims and thought that they would just, you know, fall in line because they were Republicans. And right. Do that. So, again, you're using language like or typically people who tend to make this argument use language like coup or insurrection that typically or lead. He led his supporters there. You are invoking imagery of like military dictators actually overthrowing a government. You're talking about a case where people were, like you said, passing back documents to each other. Like, could we do something here? Could we do something here? And nothing came of it. I don't understand why this matters for 2024 if we're looking at the state of the country, the material circumstances that we're all facing. And people are like, well, what about this riot at the Capitol? Or well, what about this other thing? It's like, I'm trying to pay for my car insurance. I'm trying to secure the border. There are Venezuelan gangs taking over apartment complexes in Colorado. That is insane to me. And I think that the other side, your side, has a motivation to tr try to like kind of misconstrue everything and make it more focused on these, you know, very uh, sort of hysterical instances as opposed to just what we're experiencing in the day to day. Right. So, I mean, the discussion is about democracy and about the election and uh, some level of corruption or fraud involved with that. And so, yeah, I think if you look at his uh, efforts in following the 2020 election, I think those are absolutely like important to a lot of voters because I think the representative of the individual who's unwilling to accept the results if they're not in his favor. Um, as I mentioned with Arizona and Georgia, those are pretty clear cut examples where he reached out and tried to have them not certify the results. He obviously uh, tried to get Mike Pence to not certify the results and was uh, incredibly uh, upset with him following his decision not to. Uh, and we saw that Trump supporters were also not too happy with Mike Pence. So if you want to talk about the economy, you can talk about the economy. But if you want to talk about the election democracy, then I think uh, it's uh, completely unfair to say that uh, January 6th and 2020 are completely irrelevant in the minds of voters. Well, I think that democracy, which I disagree with principally, but I think that when we talk about democracy, it's important because it's supposed to reflect the will of the voter. And I think the reason I would say that Trump is actually better for democracy, which, by the way, if you look at polling of people in swing states, a majority of them are actually saying they trust Trump more than Kamala to handle the issue of democracy insofar as you feel that that's a concern. But I think it's important because as we've been discussing all day, Trump was actually able to break free from these orthodoxies in American politics, be those orthodoxies on foreign policy, immigration policy, or trade policy, in a way that Americans had polled in support of for decades, but nobody was willing to do for them until Donald Trump. And I think that's why, on the corruption side of things, he has had to face persecution with a fine tooth comb. Everybody else is fine. They get to go to work. But Donald Trump has always got some scandal in the media. He's always being, you know, charged with something. And you can either think that that's because he actually is just the worst and everybody else isn't that bad. Or you can think, wait a minute, maybe he's onto something when he talks about draining the swamp. Maybe there's a reason why only Trump is facing this level of persecution for the first time in any of our lifetimes. And it's because he's actually trying to do the things that he says he is. Are you principally against what you call persecution or having some sort of process? No. So you're not against it? No. So then when you mentioned Donald Trump and having these um, civil and criminal cases, it's not on the basis of him facing, facing persecution. It's specifically because you think it's harmful it's lawfare. to... It's lawfare. But I, I'm asking, do you think lawfare is principally wrong? Like if he tries to go after people that he believes are no, disloyal to the him? The good part with lawfare is that it should be applied universally. What I don't like is this big, ugly bureaucracy that is only invoked to go after people when they go against the way that the political establishment wants things to go. How are you doing, sir? John, nice to meet you. All right. So about uh, Trump, he uh, got some uh, supporters called the Proud Boys. Yeah. So when they um, marched the Capitol, he told them to stand up and stand down. What do you think that mean? I think the quote you're referring to is when he said, stand back and stand by. Yeah. Right. 
Um, that was said during a debate when I think somebody was asking him a question about that. Again, that's just Trump saying, you know, get away, get off to the side, things like that. I don't think that that's actual grounds for, you know, inciting a riot or something like we saw, which again, if Trump actually were guilty of inciting a riot, then that's what they would have charged him for instead of just, you know, improprieties with his business handling. So the legal criteria for inciting an insurrection, inciting a riot, he didn't even meet, which is why they didn't try to do that. The media will say otherwise because it makes him look like an evil, scary, you know, kind of dictator. But I don't think that's actually what we saw. I mean, the Proud Boys are a group of like, you know, it's like a drinking club and guys get stupid and out of hand. And then there were actually people on January 6th who were opening up doors, escorting them into the Capitol, telling people, hey, let's break down barriers. People who were in cooperation with the federal government because they wanted that riot to occur. They wanted all that chaos. So they could use it to make Donald Trump look like what a about, terrorist. What about the KKK that's a part of the uh, Donald Trump election? Uh, to my knowledge, David Duke has endorsed Jill Stein. Uh, David Duke is like the former leader of the KKK. He just in, in, uh, he just endorsed Jill Stein, who's, a, I guess, the nominee for the Green Party, which is some like environmental thing. So uh, the KKK are not friends of Donald Trump's. Are you for sure? I'm positive. 100% sure. But I know he's a, a, a supremacist, so that's really... Do uh, you think Trump is a white supremacist? Oh, uh, for sure. Why? Just, just on the comments and the and the hand gestures and stuff when he's in the crowd, when he's giving his, you know, his debates and all that stuff, it just, you know, seems like whether that's what he was. It's just like the vibes. You're gonna you're gonna write the man off because he gives no, the vibes. It's just a, the stuff that he say, like you know, uh, grab a grab a woman by the, you know, stuff like that. And then, that's a, that's a woman thing. It's locker room talk. Yeah, it's I mean, he's us. a woman. And then you know, he just downgrades woman, you know, every, every chance to get, every time he talks, you know, on a, uh, anywhere, TV, uh, debate, anything, he's just, you know, I don't think he's right for this, you know, election. That's why I just, yeah, and, and that's your prerogative as a, as a voter. I think that um, it's easy to write Trump off because of things he says, but ultimately, if you look at how he delivers for the American people, I think his record is, uh, is pretty much unimpeachable, especially when compared to what the Biden administration has done, what Kamala Harris has done. I mean, she had the lowest approval rating of any vice president while she was in that position, which she still is. She's free to do anything she wants. She's second in command. It's not like Biden's running the White House. I don't think anyone believes that. So it's like, what is she doing? What could she do right now? I mean, again, it's easy to look at what Trump said seven years ago about women, or even I think the Access Hollywood tape was in, in what, about 2005, Rosie 2006. I mean, Rosie, I mean, she is, you know, a little hard on the eyes, I guess, but we won't get into that. I mean, if anything, that was maybe a true comment Trump made, if you think he's dishonest. Um, uh -huh. But again, I don't think that that is a accurate way to measure his performance as a president, which again, we saw did a fantastic job in his first administration. All right. Uh, nice talking to you. Um, you said democracy or corruptions, and mm -hmm. I think that's Donald Trump middle name, corrupt, because that's John. what, that's what he stands, name. that's what he stands for, corrupt. He's mm -hmm. corrupt because um, first of all, I just want to comment on two things you said. He wasn't near nine. He wasn't near ground zero. Yeah, he was. No, he wasn't. You can find the video. He on came YouTube. afterwards because mm -hmm. he wants to showboat. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was there. Okay. My best friend got lupus because she was there. I have family that were police officers that were there. Donald Trump was nowhere near that until afterwards. Rudy Giuliani, he cleaned up that place though, but Donald Trump was nowhere. He always wants to show face afterwards. Okay. So that's one thing I'm going to get you on with that okay. one. Okay. Now the corrupt thing that he has done with trying to play like he didn't, um, the, when the election wasn't fair that mm -hmm. he lost. Okay, that he won it. He did not win it. He's setting up the precedent for this election, too, with the same thing. He's trying to set up right now to make it look like it's not fair when he loses, because he will lose. He will lose. I don't know if he that's true. Lose. He will lose. I think that he's looking okay. pretty good in the polling. He is going to lose. Okay. okay. The polling does not reflect everybody. It's just a little, some amount of people. Um, I think that to use the word corrupt to describe Donald Trump is just illiterate to what we've seen. I mean, he got up there on the debate stage against all of those Republican career politicians. And he told them, you guys are all liars. I'm the only one who can say that I'm self-funded. And you, if you go back and watch those, uh, those debates, he was getting booed by the audience, by all of those donors and special interests. That's the Republican establishment. Those are the swamp creatures who everybody here probably thinks has done a horrible job running the country. They hated Trump because he was right. 
They couldn't buy him. They couldn't use him like they could Jeb Bush, Ted Cruz, any of these people to just be a puppet, which again is why he was able to break free successfully on those establishment orthodoxies, put more money back into the pockets of Americans, get us out of the Middle East, out of these foreign conflicts, start to secure our border. And because he dared to do those things, because he dared to say that we can make America great again, these people have stopped at literally nothing to make him go away. You know, they say time flies when you're having fun, but I guess I just wanted it to last a little longer. That was our video, ladies and gentlemen. That was our journey. We've all grown. We've all learned a little bit more about the American electorate. Who Remember, these people are all going to vote. If you do not vote, if you do not bring many of your cool and handsome friends with you to cancel out the votes of those who are opposed to the American way, then what are you doing? Are you just doom scrolling? Are you just watching content like this all day? That's, what, that's fine if it's my content, but, but what if it's not? What if you're just wasting away? So true. John, go for president. So true.